I've seen girls when they meet their best friends, they go out shopping. Girls have no qualms, no, they are not shy. They hold hands, they carry each other's handbag, I think. They go together to the loo together as if they need support. But they are friends. When we guys get together, we are not shy to put our arms around each other and hug each other like that. In fact, some of my friends, when they leave my home, we say goodbye to each other about 12 times. Even in the car, they will say goodbye. And they'll reach out and try to hug you one more. We're not shy. Our wives are think, thinking these guys are mad. And then when they reach home, they will text and say, I've reached home safely. That's friends. You know, God treats you like that. And for you to be called a friend of God, he's not your enemy. The devil is your enemy. But the, but the religion likes to make God look like he's angry with you. No, he is your friend. And he calls you my friend. Aren't you glad you're in the house of God? I'm so glad you all came today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. What a great time. Thank you. Let's give the musicians what a great time. It I know it wasn't easy worshipping the Lord, but you worship God anyway. You know, we've had problems with our technical problems and all of that. Basically, what I want to tell you is that we need a brand new... What do we need? Tell it. Tell it. Ask for the biggest, best thing. Because God's going to touch somebody's heart today to buy it for the church. What, what do you need? Okay, what do we, what do we really need? Uh, Chin Fei, what do we really need? The best. Computer. Yeah, I know it's a computer lab. Okay, find out from him. <laughs> Just buy it. That thing is gone. I think they murdered it. Give it a decent burial and bury it. Today, while you're still standing, I also have my son. You, you, I, I've been a father of so many kinds of children. But this one was my Tang Sudo instructor. Some years ago, um, over because of a few incidences, I went back to be trained in the Tang Sudo gym. His name is Lee Sangjae. He is a five dan, six dan holder in martial arts. And I went back there to make the long story short. It was a small school in Klang. I went back there and he was not a Christian. He didn't believe in God. He was a hard man. Him and his wife, they were very hard into whatever they believed. Very out of this world. To make the long story short, they became Christians. They both gave their lives to Jesus. Stella and I led them to the Lord. Cast out every kind of demon that they had. They had so many demons. Cast out the demons. And they became, baptized them. And they are now full-fledged Christians serving in a Korean church, even though they live in Klang, but used to come to our church. And here is his son, whom I've known since he was a little boy. And he's here today. And he came to invite me to his wedding. He's marrying a Malaysian Yongu, put up your hand. Let's give this is my Korean son. Yongu! His father would shout, Yongu, come say hello to Master Joe. He cannot say pastor, so he called me master. So I became the master. And this is my spiritual son and his sister Lucy, who is somewhere else. And she and I'm so glad he tracked me down. Pastor Joe, where are you? Call me up. And then said, Where are you? Gave him the address and he's here in church today. Turn to someone and say, you're a friend of God. Turn to someone, do that, touch them, and you may be seated. Be seated. Amen. Be seated. Today, in our 40 days of purpose-driven campaign, that's why we're all wearing this T-shirt, and, uh, and the theme is, listen, it's not about you. You might think that the world runs around you to do your little bidding. I want you to know that you were not put into this world to be comfortable. I know you didn't expect that. You were not here to prosper. All those things are the byproducts that comes along when you find your purpose in God. Then you won't lose your prosperity or you won't be frightened that your success can be stolen away because God now is the one that gave you the success and when God prospers you, nobody can curse you. When God blesses you, nobody can reverse that blessing. 
So what is our point in these 40 days? That it's not about you. I want my things to be done. I want my things to be handled. I want to get it my way. I want to live. No, it's not about you. I've met a lot of successful people on their dying bed. And on their dying bed, they want to find out what is the purpose of my life. I'm sure it is not just to make money, not just to buy houses. I've done all that. Now, somebody else is using my money because I'm dying. Now, somebody else will be living in my house because I'm going to leave it empty. I'm going to go. But what was I here on earth for? Why am I still on earth for? So we started this 40 days of purpose why? So that people can get together, listen to connect groups and join connect groups, small groups, listen and read the book and all of that. And uh, so we've gone through a series. So the main theme is this. You are here because God created you for a purpose. And when you find your purpose, and that is to receive Jesus Christ, and that's just the start. That's the, that's the start. But it's a process so that you can be a blessing to other people. And on and on and on. And so we did this now three, four weeks and we're going strong. This week we want to talk about how God wants to change our life. You've often and I've often heard people say, Jesus changed me. Wow, we say, wow, that's wonderful. What, 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 what did he change you to be? Um, how did he change you? You know, Jesus changed me. Sounds uh, very dramatic. What, did he do some surgery on you or what happened? What do you mean Jesus changed me? And so there's a lot of confusion about this. Jesus can change my life. How does he do that? One day when I'm sleeping, when I'm sleeping, he does something and I wake up, I'm a different person. Or is it when I'm walking down the street and then suddenly lightning strikes me and I'm a different person? Does he zap me with his power? So we get all these kind of ideas because we hear testimonies of people say, you know, I was praying and praying and praying and praying. Is it because I, I, I sit down and pray for many, 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 many hours, then he changes me? So some people say, well, it's all God. If God wants me to be changed, God will change me. I just have to pray, I just have to wait. Then the other people will say, well, it's all about me. I have to change myself. Well, the Bible gives us a powerful verse. One of my favorite verses whenever I'm facing people who, you know, people will like to change you. Why don't you be like Mother Teresa? You're not Mother Teresa. You're not Mother anything. Okay? You might be Teresa's mother, but you're not Mother Teresa. <laughs> All right? Why can't you be like Billy Graham? Why can't you be like this great saint? God doesn't want you to be another, you know, clone. How many of you ladies know what I'm talking about? When you, when you knead the dough, you know, when you're going to make cookies or cake, then you take the cookie cutter. You know what a cookie cutter is, right? If you like stars, then you put it on the dough, then you cut all the dough, and then you put it on a tray and you bake it, and all your cookies come out the same. God isn't cookie cutting us. He loves variety. But his purpose is that we will all become like his beloved son, Jesus. We will react like him. That doesn't mean we grow long hair and live in Jerusalem, but the character of Jesus becomes our character. What is a Christian? It is C-H-R-I-S-T. Christ, I-A-N, Christian. You take out Christ, you got I-A-N, I am nothing. You learn something new today, huh? Yeah. Put Christ there, you become Christian. Take him out, you're nothing. And so we want to become like what God intended us to be. How does that happen? How does God change me? Listen to this verse. And this is what it says in Philippians chapter 2. Get your Bibles. Underline that. Because the next time somebody comes around and tries to give you a guilt trip, why your church, your worship leader wear jeans? How come your pastor wear t-shirt? Why your music like lock and low? How come he's wearing a cross? Is he Catholic or is he protestant? I'm protesting nothing. Why? Why so weird? Okay? 
Calm down when people ask you questions like that. You know the speaker who is coming, Pastor Jacob Kurian, is an apostle. When we first started our church some 30 years, 20 some years ago, we were just a little group, first in my house. That's where I met Yonggu and his father and all of that. I used to go to Yonggu's father's gym. Everybody would be meditating, you know. They all sit on the floor after exercise. And I want you to know, it's cool when you can be a Christian and go to one of these martial art classes. Listen, the demons don't come on you. You come on those demons. I sat there and meditated with all these black belts. And Lee Sang Jae will walk like this. His eyes, Korean, look at his son. Small eyes like this. Red, very red. He walks in. Everybody meditating. Myself also meditating. But I'm meditating on Jesus. So, I prayed in tongues. Hallelujah. And I started praying in tongues. Lee Sang Jae would walk and look at me sideways. One day he said, hey, you what doing? Uh? I said, I'm meditating. What are you meditating? Uh? I said, I'm praying to my God. Who your God very big? Uh? What your God? My God, Jesus. Oh, your God, Jesus. Uh? Well, first he was very, very axy, you know. To make the long story short, He came to my office one day. He said, Master Joe, I know understand. How come your Jesus is so powerful? Ah? How come your Jesus can change you? Ah? I said, same Jesus can change you. Ah? <laughs> I pray for you. Ah. You pray. Ah. My wife got big problem, his mommy. She had big major problems. Demons coming out of her eyeballs and ears and everywhere. So I went to the house one day. Idols everywhere. A samurai sword somewhere and two. Said, I pray for you. Laid hands on her and prayed for her. She cried. She was in pain. I said, this Sunday, see you all in church. So they came to church. So she came out because women, you know, they're very hungry. She came out to the front. Prayed for her. Boom! She went under the power of God. Hey, what do you do to my wife? Huh? I said, no, no, I didn't kill your wife. Come, I pray for you too. Boom, he goes under the power of God. She starts speaking in tongues. He gets up, looks at her. She's filled with the Holy Spirit. All the wrinkles and knots and whatever that was inside. Holy Spirit just loose it all. She's crying and she's worshipping God. I want this one. I want like this. Uh, Master Joe, I want. I say, okay, now very late. Next week you come. No, no. <laughs> I said, I, he, I said, next week come. He said, no, no, I want now. I said, you want now? I take it now. I'm grateful. He started speaking in tongues. And we became friends for a long, long time. How does God change you? How come, Pastor, you can go to martial arts? Don't you know all that is demonic? Yes, there's demonic there, but greater is he who is in me. Listen, don't try to let people corrupt your salvation. I repeat that. Don't let people twist and try to mold you into their idea of salvation. Go buy this book. Okay? Whether it's in your iPad or phone, God wants us to be made in the image of his son. Do you see Jesus sitting down somewhere, sucking his thumb and crying, the world is so bad, there's demons everywhere. I go to the temple and so there are demons there. Father, why did you put me in this horrible world? That's how some Christians behave. Jesus walked among them. He was unstoppable. Until he said, I will lay down my life and die. No man can take my life from me. And God wants us to be like that. In your short life on earth, what, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years? It's kindergarten compared to the eternity that God will give us in the very near future. You're going to see God one day. And when you're with God, there's no death. So here, whatever we are going through, learn from these things and allow God's word and his spirit to shape us. Now this verse is very powerful. It says, continue to work out. Everybody say, work out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, 
For it is God who works in. Everybody say works in. All right. So work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Now, you do not work for your salvation. Your salvation is a gift from God. The Bible says we are not saved out of our good works or our own righteousness. Whenever you think you are being a Christian or a follower of Jesus because you earn points with God, because you observe all the laws, you are lost. Because only one person can save you and that is Jesus Christ. And your faith in Him, you are saved by grace, not of your works lest you boast, the Bible says. So don't be a boaster. God hates proud people. Are you with me? I didn't say that. The Bible says he hates pride. Alright? So you can't save yourself and I can't save myself but we are saved. That is a one-time event. Even though some of you accepted Christ about 17 times but that's okay. You got born again one time but you grow the rest of your life. It's a process. Are you following me? It's a process. Listen carefully. You work out your salvation that God worked in to you. You got saved. How did you get saved? God worked into you his salvation. But you got to work out, listen, your salvation. How do you work out? We'll talk about it in a little while. Now, you go to the gym. How many of you go to the gym? Don't put your hand, otherwise you lie and say you went or something. When you go to the gym, you don't work out to get a body. You already have a body. You're not following me. Are you following me? You work out what your body is. You work on your body. You don't work out to get a body. In the same way, you don't work out to get your salvation. You are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You are saved. Never ever doubt that. You are never going to hell. That is not your worry. Going to heaven is not your problem. That's God's business. Done. You are going to heaven. You say, I hope today, you know, if I die, will I go to heaven? Don't ever think like that. If you accepted Christ, your name is written in heaven, the Bible says. Okay, you'll never be a stranger. You're a friend of God. Amen. You move from being an enemy to become a friend because of Jesus. But you've got to work out your salvation. Listen carefully. Work out your salvation. It's a very individual, personal thing. Don't try to work out somebody else's salvation. So when people get into some kind of theological tailspin and they say, but you know, Pastor Joe, you know, uh, 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 God told me to do this and God said that to me and God, I'll just say, that's fine. You work out your own salvation. You are going to answer God. I'm not going to answer God for you. I never sweat when people say, God told me to leave the church. I'll say, can I get a taxi? How fast do you want to go? Okay? Because it's not for me to work out your salvation. You got to work out your own. You have to stand with, that's why it says, with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling doesn't mean that we are frightened of God. Listen, you're a friend of God. You're a family of God. You never have to be afraid of God ever. He's your papa. Now, however, fear and trembling talks about the consequences of your salvation. God has given you some things that are, that has eternal, eternal value, folks. You cannot play the fool with your life. That's what he's saying. There is heaven. There is reward. There is so many things that God is going to hold you and I accountable. On earth, what you live, how you live. So, because you have eternal consequences that God will say, I gave you a life. I spilled my blood for you. I destroyed sin over your life. Now, what are you doing with it? Oh, I'm just lazing my life. Listen, you have to give an account to God. 
Don't worry about what Pastor Joe said because it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about you and God. I have to work out my salvation, my own salvation. It's an individual thing. Pastor, pray for me. Can we are called to pray for one another? Of course, I'll pray for you. But your lifestyle and the rest of your life is your choice. Listen carefully to this message. You are responsible for your change. Oh, if my wife was better, I will be a better husband. Don't come and tell me especially. That's why I don't waste time. People say, no, Pastor Joe's got no patience. No, because you're talking rubbish. You chose to marry her. Nobody put a gun on your head. You chose to marry him. Nobody forced him. Want to walk out of it? Walk out. Sometimes people will say, you know, Pastor, I feel I want to get a divorce. I said, divorce. I cannot work out your salvation. Well, Pastor, don't you have anything to say? What can I say? Whatever I say, this is already said. Are you reading this? Or not? I'm in confusion. Why are you confused? God is not the author of confusion. God is not the author of... He's the God of order. He's the God of design. He's the God of beauty. Why are you confused? Because you're listening to other people who have got no authority over your life. And you need to take responsibility over yourself. Okay? Now, once you can understand that, then you begin to realize, oh, so the Christian life is my personal assignment. I am responsible. I am expected by God to work out the salvation that God has worked in and he, the Bible says, that he has done according to his purpose that God has willed in you or worked in you, watch this, to will and to act. That means he gives us the energy. It is not by my strength, but it is by the energy of God. So I'm not trying by sheer willpower. Oh, I'm trying to be a Christian. I'm trying to change. I'm trying to give up this bad attitude. I'm trying to give up focusing on my past and breaking away from it. But I'm trying, I'm trying. No, you can't do it with sheer willpower. God gives you the energy. He gives you the energy. So we're going to talk about three things that God uses to change me and to change you. Number one. God uses the Bible. This is the ultimate authority. Not any other book. I'm glad you read Christian books. Not what brother so and said and so and so said. None of these things has the authority to change your life. But the Bible, the Bible, when you read the Bible, listen to me. Don't put it in your house and then when you come to church on Sunday, then you pick it up. In the meantime, seven days a week, it is there or under your pillow because you hope you won't get bad dreams. There's no magic in this book. It's just a book. But the words in this book are eternal. They are truth. And when you read them, you put them into your mind. Today, psychologists call it uh, uh, the adjustments. They call it something that has been said 2,000 years ago. When you read the word of God, your mind is renewed. Okay, we'll come to that in a little while. But this is the word of God. If you wonder why you're still battling with some habits or some demons in your house, I want to ask you, have you been reading the word of God? Hello, look at me. Are you reading the word of God? Don't come and tell me I'm dry. I'm not, that's not our job. It's not here to pamper you. Our job is to tell you God's purpose for your life and release you into the world to make a difference. It is your responsibility and my response. I may be a pastor now for 38 years means nothing. If I don't read the Bible, even if it's just one verse for me to meditate the whole day, I will do that. I don't have to read gallons of chapters, although I do. And I've read this book through many times, but there's always something fresh and something new. This is the word of God. The Bible is G what Jesus said, thy word is truth. Heaven and earth will pass away. My word will never pass away. Number two, God uses the Bible 
which is the word of God, and God uses the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not Casper, a small white little ghost floating around. I know old, old King James Version calls him, you know, the Holy Ghost. So you think that he's some kind of a floating little thing. Some people think a oh, Holy Ghost means, oh, he makes me all get goosebumps and I feel, who my hair standing. He is a person, just like Jesus is a person. Jesus said, I'm going, but he's coming. And now he doesn't just walk in Israel, he lives in your body. He is the Holy Spirit who comes and will never leave you nor forsake you. We'll talk about him in a little while more. But the Holy Spirit is the connection in your prayer life, in your changing, where you depend on him. He's the one. He doesn't shout at you. He doesn't say, why are you doing this? No, he speaks very softly. So in other words, you need to calm down. You need to be quiet and listen to him. He speaks in a beautiful voice. You know it is him because he never barks at you. He never threatens you, but he will tell you the truth. He'll say, you need to change that. When you do something wrong and you get all, two things happen. One is you get guilty. The other one is you feel ashamed. Guilty is because you did something wrong, we made a mistake. A shame is when the devil comes and says, that's who you are. But really, that's not who you are. You are a child of God. You did something wrong, Holy Spirit will say, bad boy, you need to change. You need to get your app together. You need to say, I'm sorry. You need to repent and you need to change. But he will never say, that's who you are. You're a liar. You're a cheater. You're a gambler. You're a good-for-nothing person. See, always making the same mistake. That's not the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's the voice of the accuser. The Holy Spirit is your lawyer. He champions you. He says, you're a son of God. You know who you really are? You're made in the image of God. You're a daughter of God. God has destined you with things you can never even dream of. I was there. I come and go. I built this universe. God has got all these things for you. That's not you. You're a wonderful person. That's the Holy Spirit. He will never say, see what you are? You ought to be ashamed. When Peter fell and he went away fishing, didn't want to see Jesus anymore, he denied Jesus three times and the cockerel crowed. Ah, ah, ah. Every morning, I want you to think about this, think about this, think about this. When he said, when they said to him, you are a disciple of Jesus, he said, I'm not. Somebody else said, hey, you look just like a disciple of Jesus. We know, we saw you before. He said, I'm not. And the third person said, yes, you are. One I saw you following him. And he cursed. Okay, he swore. I, he said all kinds of bad words. He was a fisherman, what do you expect? <laughs> Every kind of bad word he swore. He said, I, that's not me. And when he said that, the cockerel crowed. Jesus said, when you tonight you will deny me three times and the cockerel will crow. <laughs> And the moment he said the third time, the cockerel crowed. And he turned and he saw Jesus being taken out. And Jesus stopped and looked at him one last time. Now I want you to know. He ran away and the Bible said he cried bitterly. I can identify with Peter. I don't know about you. Maybe you are all very nice for you. I'm like that fellow. I'm so weak. And when the cockerel crowed, <laughs> Every morning, he would hear the cockerel crow. Isn't that right? We all, guess what? Every one of us know the cock crows in the morning. Every time he hears the cockerel crow, the cockerel was saying, that's who you are. You ought to be ashamed. That's who you are. You are a traitor. You are a betrayer. You are a failure. Oh, Peter. Ah, ah, ah! Means you have failed. Every day, the cockerel will remind him. I wonder what the cockerel is crowing over your life. You are a cheater. You are an adulterer. Ah, ah, ah! You are a lustful person. But I want you to know Jesus broke that. When he rose from the dead, he came to Peter. It was in the morning. Instead of hearing the cockerel crow, this is in the book of John. Peter sees Jesus in the morning, by the beach, making breakfast. That's how God, <laughs> I'm a friend of God. You see, he never, listen, he never betrays his friend. We betray him. We don't understand friendship. 
I'm going off on a tangent now. I'm not sticking the notes now. So you better listen because this is good. <laughs> Have you boys had breakfast? Hey, that sounds familiar. No cockerel crowing this morning. You want breakfast or not? Suddenly they realize it's Jesus. Peter jumps in and Jesus meets him, cooks breakfast. After they all had breakfast, Peter is standing there. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know I love you. He said, good. Feed my sheep. Take care of your purpose in life. Sure, you were a bad boy, you blew it. But you haven't lost your purpose yet. You're still alive and I'm alive, Peter. It's not about you. It's about me. Feed my sheep. Get busy with the business of the kingdom. Don't get stuck with this cockerel kind of theology. Get busy with feeding, building, strengthening my kingdom. Then he asked Peter again, second time. Peter, do you love me? He said, I love you, Lord. You know I love you. He said, good. Feed my sheep. Same question. Same answer. Third time. Because he betrayed Jesus three times. So he was breaking the sound of the cockerel in Peter's brain. And I pray that's what the Holy Spirit will do in every single one of your lives. That the cockerel that has been crowing in your life again and again, that voice will be silent and the voice of your, your God saying to you, now come on back, I love you. I want you to feed my sheep. Get involved in the big picture. Get involved in serving me. That's the Holy Spirit. Wonderful. Number three, when we don't want to listen to the Bible and we don't want to listen to the Holy Spirit, God brings the third thing, circumstances. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that God punishes us, but what I'm saying is that it begins to happen suddenly. Have you noticed in our country, huh? just recently, this tragedy of the image 370? It's a tragedy that has shaken our country. Nobody thinks about this political party or who is playing what rock music or who is singing what song and who became number one in the charts and who, how much Bill Gates made. Nobody cares. But message after message, whether it's Hindu or Buddhist or Christian or whatever, pray for the people. Right across America, all across India. You see, Chinese women, last night I was in tears as this Chinese woman. She was being interviewed, her son was on the plane, and she knelt down on the floor, and she said, I want to thank every one of these nations for looking for my son. And she wept, and she wept, and I wept. Okay? Tragedy does something to us. It gives us, I pray that tragedies won't come in our life, but it will come. The point is, we don't know when or where. The point is, we must be ready and know how to respond. Because he will use circumstances to get our attention. Problems, pressures, heartaches, headaches. Romans chapter 8 verse 29, verse 28 and 29. It says, for those who love God and are called according to his plan, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. Everybody say for good. Now that happened may not be good, but God will turn it around and make it good. That's what God specializes in. What good is going to come out of MH370? We don't know, but it'll be good. It's not good that a plane crashes and lives are lost. It's a horrible thing when wars happen and accidents happen. When seven young people at a rock concert have overdosed in drugs and died, my daughter was going to go for the rock concert. No, not to take drugs, but to, it was a rock concert. She and her cousin came all the way from Singapore, stayed in our house planning to go for the concert, and it was cancelled. Tragedy is not nice, but it does give us a wake-up call. The Bible tells us that you are to work out your salvation. Work it out. Be diligent. That's what the church is here for. We are not here to be your policemen. But when we tell you go for connect groups, pray, you know, read your Bible, um, come together, come to church, don't sleep, cannot get up late, 
we are saying that not because we are your grandmother, okay? We are not your wife or your husband to nag at you. We are here because we are telling you, you will have to work out your salvation. If not, you won't listen properly to the Bible and to the Holy Spirit, then circumstances will happen. And when you are lying there at that time, you are praying more than anyone else. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Now we tell you to pray early, you won't pray early. Because this is a tough message to preach. I, don't, I think I'll stop. Okay? Listen, the Bible said that, that, that when there are problems that come, who caused them? Why must this happen? Is it because I sin? Or because God wants to punish me? Or is it the devil? To tell you the truth, it is not our job, it's not my job to find out why bad things happen. The, my job is to tell you, be prepared and learn how to respond to the circumstance. Because it's going to make you either bitter, angry, hateful, or better, stronger. So you can help other people. Okay? So, if God wants to teach you humility... Did you know that God can teach you in a hundred and one thousand and one ways? If he wants to humble me, he can humble me just like that. But he says, humble yourself. So you read the Bible. Bible says, humble yourself. Don't ask God to humble you. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Never pray that prayer. Oh God, keep me humble. Bang! Don't, don't, don't. Bible says humble yourself because he wants to honor you. That's what the Bible says. So you read it and you say, okay, Holy Spirit, I'm going to learn to walk in humility. I'm going to shut my mouth more. I'm going to cut down all my arrogant words about me because it's not about me. And I start to humble myself. So I read the Bible. Bible says, be humble, God will honor you. So that's what the Bible says. You hear it, you read it. Then you say, now Holy Spirit, please help me to be humble. I depend on you. Oh, Holy Spirit, I blew it again. I became so arrogant. I was ticked by so and so. God will allow circumstances to come to challenge that humility you are praying for. Or that honor that is coming. So you read the Bible. All right. So, so we saw three things that God will do. Okay. Three of God's resources. Very quickly. What, are, what is my part? So there is the God part. Then there is the my part. You cannot sit down and say, God, you do everything. You cannot also sit down and say, I'm going to do everything. There is the God part. God working in you. There is your part. You working it out. So three choices I have. That will help me to change my part. Okay, this is my part. God part, he gave you Bible, gave you Holy Spirit. He will create circumstances. My part, number one, I can choose what I want to think. I can choose my thought life. So growing, we know, in the Lord is not automatic. I make a choice every day. Listen, you are not a robot. God made you in his image. You have the power to choose. So you got God's word. God's word says rejoice in the Lord. But Lord, I'm feeling very crappy now because I just quarreled my wife. And I don't feel like joy. But Holy Spirit, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will stir up that joy that's inside of me. Help me, Holy Spirit. And then you start aligning your mind listen the bible word for the word repentance is not mm, i'm so sorry for what i've done repentance is a change of mind i now begin to read god's word i realize that god has got bigger and better things for me the bible says it like this in ephesians chapter 4 verses 23 to 25 it says this your mind must be renewed by a spiritual revolution so that you can put on the new self that has been created in God's way. So that's what repentance is all about. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the Bible says, be transformed. How? By trying to go be a good person? No. By the renewing of your mind. Psychologists call this behavioral modification. But they are only telling you to change your behavior. Listen carefully. Okay, look, look at me. Why do we behave? Why do we do certain things? Why is our actions like that? We don't like it, but why is it like that? Okay? So the, bio, the, the psychologist will say, change your behavioral action. The Bible says, the problem is, it's in your mind first. Okay? 
I begin to think depressive thoughts. I'm sad. I'm down. I've been hurt. And you think and think and think and think. You listen to all the sad songs. Like the old one by the carpenters in the 1963 became popular. Why does the sun go on shining? Why does the sea rush to shore? And you think and you think, don't they know? It's the end of the world. It ended when you said goodbye. So heartbroken, eh? Think and think, he don't love me. You think she's prettier than me, eh? You know, I'm much prettier than her. What does she have? I don't have. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you think, okay? Your mind plays that record. You start to feel what you think. You start to really begin to let it go deep down inside. Action, you get depressed. You act depressed. You don't want to talk to people. You want to switch off the light, lock the door, kill yourself. Because the song said, what? why does the sun, what for when the sun want to come? Go, you think. So here is what the Bible does. The Bible will come as you read God's word. God's word will challenge your thinking. Read it. Memorize it. Speak it. Read it loud. This is what God says. Come, let us build the walls of Jerusalem. That's talking about me. I need to build back the walls in my life. All scripture is good. Every word of God you can apply because this is the word of God. It doesn't have seasons. It doesn't run for people's time. It is for everybody. Apply the word of God. It will change your life. Begin to renew your mind. I'm not going to be thinking like that. I'm going to be thinking God's power. Listen carefully. Imagine you're driving a speedboat. A speedboat, fast going, powerful boat. You're going down. And it's set on automatic. So it's set to go automatic towards the east. Listen carefully, young people, this will help you. It's set automatic on automatic mode. You put your hand like that, it's still going east. But suddenly you say, no, no, I want to go west. But the automatic button is still there. Listen, you try to steer it. Steer. You're trying to make it go that way. Still, that was still going. Still, 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 still a little bit more. Let go, boom, going back there again. Still, because the automatic response is going east. What is our automatic response in our mind? When something bad happens, <laughs> I'm out of here. That's an automatic response. Somebody says something, oh, I'm hurt. <laughs> I want to fight back. That's our automatic. That's how we were program now we need to say this doesn't control my life anymore the word of god controls my life as you read it you begin to say take charge of my life so the bible says in psalms 1 verses 1 to 3 blessed is the man who meditates on god's word in philippians chapter 4 he says on all these things Think on these things. Colossians chapter 3 verse 6. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Psalms 1 verse 19. Your word have I hid in my heart. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. The secret of success is to meditate on God's word. How much more do you need to be convinced? Number two. You can choose to depend on God's Holy Spirit every moment. How do I do that pastor? Pray. It doesn't mean close your eyes and pray. It means every moment you're going through a decision. There's a deadline. There's pressure in your world. And you just say, Holy Spirit, help me. Give me the strength. Jesus said, I am the, I am the vine. You are the branches. As long as you are connected with me, your fruit will always remain. Whatever you ask from me, Jesus said in John 15, you will get it. Because you're connected with me. How do I stay connected? Talk to God every day. You don't need to kneel down or be pious. You just talk to Him. Like how? You know, you know He's so intimate with you. Just share with Him. God, I'm going through this. 
somebody puts you down, you go to the bathroom or whatever, and you just stand in front of the mirror, instead of saying, I could take that person out, you know, you just say, Holy Spirit, just help me now to calm down my natural response, my automatic response, but just come to you and I ask you to calm me down. So that's your prayer life. And number three, you can choose your response in any situation. So you read the word, you depend on the Holy Spirit, and then you make a choice every single day how you're going to respond. And remember, you won't always get it right. It's a process. But as you begin to habitually do what God wants you to do, you will find change is coming. Change. How many of you want change in your life? Can I see your hand? I mean, you really want to see some things change in your life. And listen, don't let the devil talk to you. I pray that this message will so encourage you. Now, this Saturday, I didn't finish my announcement about Pastor Jacob Courier. When we first started our church, I talked about Yongu's dad. Those were the pioneer people who came into our church. And then somebody came and poured gasoline into our church under the door and lit the church on fire. The police came. I had to go and talk to the police and all of that. When nobody else wanted to come to our church, and remember, we pioneered it. We didn't take over this church from anybody. We didn't inherit any church members from anywhere. We started it in our home with our children and just a couple of friends, and then that's it. Nobody, when nobody wanted to come, Jacob Kurian, this prophet who's coming this Saturday, he came. And he spoke for us. And let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about this man. He's a man of God. He comes from India, from Kerala somewhere. But he's lived for 40 over years in Houston, Texas. And he moves very powerfully in the prophetic. When we pioneered our church, he called out a few people, told them exactly what they were going through and what God had planned for them. As their pastor, I watched them. I didn't tell him anything. And I watched them. I saw God's hand on them. And over the years, God had raised them up like this. Not like this. Like this. Because the prophet came. He spoke the word of God. And the Bible tells us, if you believe in the Lord, you'll be established. If you believe the word of the prophet, you will prosper. That's, that's God's word. Because you take the word of God and you say, I believe. So this Saturday at 7.30, bring your friends. Come along. This man will pray for you. And listen listen carefully this saturday okay some of you ask is there a service on sunday yes there's a service on sunday as well but just saturday night especially just for our clan church we want you to bring as many people as you can come here and worship the lord together as i close remember the power to change is god's the desire to change is yours the power to change you and I. Of course, God desires that we change. Pastor, I want to change. I don't want to be the same person every year. I don't want to be the one that's hurting my children or embarrassing my family. I want to change. I want my life to really change. Jesus, change me. How will he do that? Through his word, through the Holy Spirit. Listen, there's no shortcut. You have the same Holy Spirit I have. I don't have more of the Holy Spirit. I don't have more access to the world. We all have the same. We have circumstances. We cannot measure that. But let's be open to God and say, Lord, I'm willing to change. How many of you are willing to change? Can I see your hands? You want some things to change radically in your life. Now break that cycle. Maybe your father and mother put you in. Maybe it's a family cycle that we can't be helped. That's what I inherited. No, 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 no. You're a child of God. You inherit what God wants you to inherit in Jesus' name. Break that cycle and let it be you. Let it start with you. And let it stop with you. Whatever your family used to pass down, it stops here right now because I'm a child of God. And a new life is going to start with me. It's never going to be like I'm not going to inherit all that rubbish that used to be passed down. I'm a new person. In Christ Jesus. Stand together. Let's stand together. Praise God. Holy Spirit of God. Holy Spirit of God. Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit.
Christ, right where you're standing, lift it up high to God as an act of surrender to Him. Lord, I surrender myself to you. Give myself to you. Lord, I want change in my life. Change me. Melt me. Take away all those things that hinder me. Change me. Strip me down. Remove chains and bondages in my life habits mindsets change change holy spirit of god change we welcome you holy spirit as our hands are lifted up forgive us where we have not been listening to your voice and obeying your word we want to obey your word we want to respond and say amen to your word we want to read your word, speak your word, and declare it over our lives in faith. Holy Spirit, come and help us. We are weak. We are weak. Come. Holy Spirit of the living God. Holy Spirit of God. Let's sing. Let's worship. Let's take time. Listen. In our services, we're not going to be rushing. We did it in care last week and we just say, let's enjoy God. And so we stayed another half an hour and people just loved it. Now, it's not a matter about time, how long or how short our service is. But if we want change, it's going to take a process. It's going to take time. It doesn't end here in the service when we say goodbye. It continues to go on when you go home. And decisions that you have to make. And lifestyle and mindsets that God will challenge you and say, That's not you. That's not you. This is who you are. You're a beautiful woman. You're not a woman who breaks down and, and gets nervous and, and becomes intimidated or become hyper and violent. That's not you. You're my daughter. You're the apple of my eye. You're beautiful. I've raised you up to have a purpose in this life. That's not you. Then he will tell you, do you what you're supposed to do. Feed my sheep. Get involved in the big picture. You are the first. You are the last. No one is greater than you. No name is
so the enemy comes to you or our autopilot begins to say somebody in the office got a promotion somebody stole your place autopilot will automatically say hate that person this person is cheated autopilot responds and I'm going to get angry I'm going to be lousy the whole week somebody took my project I worked so hard for it somebody refused to be kind to me when I was kind to them natural response autopilot if you're on autopilot automatic response what our fathers used to do and what we used to do said we hold a vengeance and a grudge or we can shift gears and say the Bible says to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice so today is his day he's got the promotion that's cool next time it'll be my turn if he cheated me that's between him and God there is a God my job is not to take vengeance or to get really angry and hate that person I cannot handle hatred I will die so I gotta let it go and walk on and wish them well then God watches our response he says that's exactly what my son did did you know the Bible says look at me for a while Bible says Jesus learned obedience through suffering if Jesus needed to learn obedience through suffering do you think you're bigger than Jesus it says that in the book of Hebrews in your notes so when we go through that something good is going to come up so God says look that's exactly how my son behaves you are in the image of my son now I want to honor you now I will give you whatever they try to take from you I'm going to give it back to you many times more not the devil my reaction I don't care what the devil may plan what people may plan or even if it was God's pattern my reaction is that what the Bible says Holy Spirit help me to fulfill it and I choose to respond in Jesus name lift your hands right while you're standing father give us the ability the strength give us that discipline to read your word apply it to speak it to apply the Holy Spirit in our life we want to change come Holy Spirit help us to change to be more like Jesus we ask it in your precious name amen amen are you happy today have you received the word of God let's give the Lord praise amen. they like to do this in our KL church and also in our Plank church it's the last few moments of the church the food can be smelled oh that makes me drool it's very hard to pray without spitting because now I'm drooling <laughs> listen don't want you to go home stay love one another chit chat pray for one another okay there are people in this church who are mighty men and women of God who love to pray for you but if you don't tell them if you don't say come please pray for me only the pastor can pray for me you're wrong you have to be disciplined enough to go up to a brother or sister you trust that's church family and say brother can you pray for me they will call all the connect group members they will lay hands on you they will pray with you Okay? don't just only the pastor or the guest speaker this church is about a family amen we belong to each other so the Lord bless you let's do one last song I'm a friend of God that's a good one <laughs> all right here we go